Thank you that I can be here and speak here. This is the final result of an idea which is probably not how the aircraft will look like in the end. It's just an idea and here we have what I came up with but it doesn't have to look that like this in the end. Probably it will look way differently. The purpose or, or the, the, the goal of this presentation now will be for me to explain to you how, how I got there, what what may, I, I'll just want to express to you the train of thought which led there. Because this might not be um, the perfect, there's no perfect configuration, never. And um, this might not be, there, there might be something better around. So I want to just explain to you how I got there and maybe, you know, there's, there's a point where you say, well, I don't quite agree there, so you could go in another direction and then you might up, end up with something else. So, yeah, just let me start here with uh, a blank sheet of paper. So that's, that's how, how you start when you want to design anything. You, you, you basically don't have anything. And you just need to think how you how you will how you will approach that situation and uh, what you want to do. So there's a there's a quite nice saying which I like. Um, it goes: It seems that perfection is attained not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing more to remove. Which um, is quite nice for engineering problems because most of the time you will find that the best solution is the simplest solution. So you want not a lot of parts, you just want to have maybe what they call synergies. You want to use different parts or one part for different things actually. So you just want to have a very simple device. And for, for, for this purpose here, we want to create um, an airplane which can transport people from one airport to another airport. So that's kind of the boundary we have here. So I don't want to change or look at this whole aspect of, at this whole aspect of, um, of, of the whole infrastructure. So let's just say we have our airports and we have people who travel every day and we only want to look at the vehicle, at the aircraft. So that, that's, that's our starting point here. And then we want to do that as simple as possible. So we take away the aircraft, we have our airports and we want to see how we, how we approach that. <coughs> and um, there's, at the beginning of this presentation, I want to make a, 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 a statement or, or give an opinion or an intuition which I think is, um, yeah, which I think is true and from what everything else which I do here will be derived. So I think to fly you <coughs> only need a wing. And I think that the volume inside that wing is sufficient for passengers. I think that this is an efficient solution. And I, I, I think that so far in the history it might have not been tackled enough to how to use that volume efficiently inside the room. So, so that's the, the thought. And from that thought, now we can start to, to think of a configuration around that. So, when we say we only need a wing, well then, the, um, the path from that on is clear. We want to design a flying wing. So an aircraft, which is only a wing, where we have people sitting inside the wing. And so we can just declare our, our task here. So to make that real clear. So we want to design a passenger aircraft as a flying wing. So now there are many different, many different 
um, definitions of the world uh, of the word flying wing out there. So let me just make that really clear here. A flying wing is an aircraft or an object heavier than air with no more than one lifting surface in the direction of flight. So when you fly an aircraft, you, you obviously have a direction. And you have a lifting surface, which is the wing. And you have, with normal aircraft, you have a horizontal tailplane surface behind that wing, or some other surface in front of the wing. So this is not what is designed here. That's the, the thesis statement at the beginning is really that we only need one wing. And of course, as I said, preferably a pure flying wing. So we don't want any extra parts exposed to the outside. We would really like to have only, only the wing and nothing more. Maybe some, some engines for thrust, but um, the, the ultimate goal is to, to really create only a wing and store everything we have inside. So to, to how, how, how do you approach such a task? So, so now we have the task to design a flying wing. And um, first of all, of course, you need to, to, to check out what's out there already. So you need to look at the, they say, state of the art. So what is there? What has been done? What's the history? You don't want to do something which somebody else might have already done. And um, then from that, you can try to generate a new concept. And then, of course, you need to check if that concept is good. So you compare that concept to a reference. All right. So um, that is the state of the art. It's the Airbus A350. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, the state of the art is, of course, also any um, configuration of that sort where you have a fuselage, a wing, and some tail surfaces. So also any other aircraft. That is just the latest version, which is out now. So I took that here. Um, so um, first of all, so first of before we, before we even look at some uh, historical aspects here, just very briefly some 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 flight physics. So when our airplane flies, any kind of airplane. We have the airplane right here. The airplane has a center of gravity. It's, it's quite simple. The airplane has a certain mass. So you have gravitational force here, lift here, and then, of course, that would be ideal. But uh, unfortunately, we have some drag. <coughs> and because we do have some drag, we need thrust. And of course, it would be the goal to have um, a drag which is as low as possible, just by intuition, of course, to be very efficient, to fly efficiently. And I, I explain that now because I want to explain to you why this configuration looks the way it looks. So that's why we need some 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 basics here in flat physics. So you would think maybe, first of all, we should give some kind of quantification for efficiency. When is an aircraft efficient? So I'm not going to write many formulas here today, but maybe two or three. So, so this is the first. Um, and it's not even quite correct. So, but it's, um, it's enough for what we want to do. So when we have a unit of fuel, a fuel with a certain mass, we can travel a certain way with that unit of fuel. <laughs> so that's our unit of fuel, and we can travel a certain way. And now we say our aircraft is efficient when we can travel very far with that unit of fuel. So when, so, so now we have some factors which are here, which are good, and some which are too good, which are down. So um, we want to travel very far. So, um, of course, if we are very fast, that is good. Of course, some of those other factors here will depend on our velocity of the aircraft. 
So here is the speed of sound at the Mach number, which gives our velocity. And um, this should be high. Um, then we want to have a high L over D. The L over D is um, just this divided by this, lift divided by drag. And we want to have, of course, lift we cannot really change for a cruise flight. So, um, yeah, the only thing we can change is drag, actually, if you want to have low drag. And um, what else do we have here? Just our mass of the aircraft, which should be very low. And then our engine performance. <coughs> and this is the so-called specific fuel consumption. And now why does that configuration look the way it does when we have that formula here? Um, first of all, we have um, we need to transport passengers somehow. So it is more for probably 50 or 60 years now, people um, are um, the, 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 the passengers of the aircraft sit in a pressurized fuselage. Why pressurize? Because we fly very high and um, the density of the air is not very great, so, uh, not very high, so we need to, to put some pressure inside the cabin. Um, this pressure is stored very well in a cylindrical fuselage. So, um, of course, you could argue, we, we, why might we not, why don't we use a sphere? Because a sphere is even better. But um, we have some other parts on the aircraft, and to to just to just all arrange it in a way which is uh, which is good for everything. The cylindrical fuselage has, um, yeah, in, in in the history, has proven to be the best solution so far. And um, well, now. The aircraft should fly. So to create our um, our lift, we use wings attached to that fuselage. Um, the question is, how do we get our lift to drag ratio to be very low? So how do we uh, sorry very high? How do we get the drag to be very low? How do we minimize drag? And people have found that out. They have found out that drag of an aircraft is made up of two main um, components. One of them is the drag of, that the aircraft has with the air when, uh, because of friction. It's just friction drag, and this friction drag just depends on the wetted area of the aircraft. So if I, um, just the exposed surface of the aircraft, and we want, so that is our um, friction drag. And then we have another drag component. And this drag component is depending on our lift, actually. If our aircraft doesn't fly, um, of course, we don't have that um, drag. But if we start to create lift, so if we have our aircraft here, and we fly and start to create lift, we generate downwash behind the aircraft. So air is moving down. And this air has a certain velocity, of course, and thus a certain energy. And this is lost. So uh, this is extremely brief uh, explanation here, but indeed it is some drag here. And one has found out so far that this drag is low when we have a high wingspan. So when we have a very high wingspan, we distribute that velocity. So the velocity actually is very low, and energy is velocity squared. So then we have very low velocity, uh, very low drag when we have high wingspan, such as in fighter airplanes. So we have, they call that induced drag. So, to keep that low, we have two requirements here. One is that our wetted area of the aircraft should be low, so we have low friction drag. 
You look at such a configuration way differently when you know that. So now you know that we try to keep the wetted area low of that aircraft. And now you, you really look at it quite differently. So the wetted area should be low. Or we say, um, yeah, below drag, we want the wetted area to be low. And we want the wingspan to be high. So those two, or these two requirements set a whole aerodynamic performance here for, for, for now, for a just very brief and preliminary, um, <coughs> preliminary design study here. We want low wind area and high wing span um, just to have good aerodynamic performance. So now, um, the other thing is mass, of course. Mass should be low. We don't need to explain anything there. Not, not at that stage now. So now let's see. If we want low weighted area, we don't want any wings, actually. But we need some wings, because we need to generate lift. So the wings are actually at, the wing area is as low as possible. As low as it can be to, to not have um, too much lift locally on the wing. So when we, for instance, when we take off and land, we fly it very slowly. And when we fly very slowly, we need more angle of attack. So when the aircraft flies very fast, we don't need very much angle of attack. When the aircraft flies slow, we need very much angle of attack. And um, we could build the wing area so great that it's enough. But then we would have so much wet area that our aircraft wouldn't be able to, to fly efficiently. That's why, upon takeoff and landing, we change the shape of the main wing with high lift devices. So flaps are extended so that our aircraft can still fly. Those high lift devices then create very high nose down pitching moments of the aircraft. So the aircraft starts to pitch down and we need some way to trim that. So that's why we have a horizontal tail plane. This again increases our wet area. So we would like to get rid of that. Um, another thing here is you see that we have engines. Those engines are underneath the wing. Why are they there? And why are they not somewhere else? I mean this configuration is, is, a, is a wonderful configuration. When I criticize something, I, I have very great respect for that configuration. It's most likely going to be a good configuration for, for decades and decades. And uh, what, what I present here is just, just an idea. But there, it does have a serious problem. So, which, of course, I think you're familiar with. The, the, the lift of the aircraft is created right here, whereas the mass of the aircraft is all in the middle. So this leads to very significant bending moments right here, which, uh, and those bending moments really increase the mass of the whole aircraft. So what should we do to get rid of that? Well, you can place engines right here to shift the mass from the center to the outside to make those bending moments very low. But then, what happens when one engine fails? Maybe on takeoff or so. You take off with the aircraft, one engine fails. The further those are to the outside, the better this is for the mass of the aircraft. However, if one fails, you get very strong moments and what do you need to get to, to counteract those moments? You need a vertical tailplane. And this vertical tailplane again has some wet area. So you you, you see the the um, that there's that there has been a lot of optimization work been done on those kinds of aircraft, and this is the outcome here, um, which is believed at the moment to be one of the best solutions here. So, now, um, 
Uh, there have been proposals to, to, to change some of the uh, some of the disadvantages here. So especially that distribution of mass and lift. So people have long since um, had ideas of, um, of shifting the mass to the outside. Um, just like here. This is um, a NASA study for what they call a blended wing body aircraft. And this blended wing body is um, tackles this problem of having the mass only in the middle of the aircraft. We shift the mass to the outside so our bending moments are reduced. So, um, and we have other benefits here. We can put the engines on top of the aircraft. We can make our engines bigger, which uh, usually uh, leads to uh, more efficient engines. We um, can have engines close to the center axis of the aircraft. So when one fails, we don't get very uh, high moments. So, so that is, is great about that configuration. Um, <laughs> you, you, you might maybe ask, why do we not have an infinite orc? Well, uh, why do we not have greater spend on these aircraft? Uh, well, be, be, because I said, I, I want the, the spend to be as high as possible. Well, um, the, the higher our spend is, of course, um, the, the greater are our bending moments too. So this is why. And then at, at some point, airports have adjusted to the aircraft which are around. So now you really have some gate limitations, some spend limits. So aircraft cannot just uh, have uh, the, the spend they would like to have, or which would be the optimum spend, there are certain restrictions here. So that's why um, we are restricted in our spend here, and also that those uh, aircraft are restricted in spend. And um, indeed, some of, those, um, some of those studies are better with larger spends than conventional aircraft. So conventional aircraft, I mean the mass in the middle here, they get really high bending moments when you have such a spend. When you have a blended wing body aircraft, when you distribute the mass, then you can get even greater spend without having so high bend wing bending moments. But then those aircraft don't fit inside or fit into conventional size airport gates. So this is one disadvantage here. The other disadvantage is the following. Um, inside that blender wing body, we store people also in a pressurized area. And this pressurized area, when you look at it from the front or from the side or wherever, just looks like this. So you have pressure here and always, well, you, you see what I'm getting at. Um, this will want to split open. Whereas, the conventional fuselage is just round. And here, you only have, um, you, you have no bend. So, this is why conventional fuselage, as I said before, is so nice and cylindrical. Uh, here, this is a problem. And, Generally, it was believed that this aircraft would maybe be better. Um, well, you, 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 you see what we need to have an efficient aircraft. We need a high wingspan. We cannot do too much with the wingspan because we have gate restrictions. We need low wetted area. Does that aircraft have lower wetted area than normal aircraft? Well, it's hard to judge now. There were studies. It has roughly the same. Now. Um, the mass. Well, our mass um, was meant to be, low, to be lower because we distribute our mass over the span, so create lower bending moments. Well, um, this is the problem with the mass. So, as this one's split open, there are many, many, um, there's a lot of work has been done to try to maybe to maybe have something 
here, maybe some, some tubes here with uh, beams uh, in the middle. But in the end, this is not a simple solution for the structure of the aircraft. You also get problems with evacuation. That aircraft does not have very many lines of a cabin, very many equal lines of cabin and a summit. So all these, um, all these, uh, all these disadvantages uh, have to be considered now, or I have to consider when thinking of a new aircraft. Right. So, so, so that's the state of the art. That's the state of the art is that we have a wonderful conventional configuration, <coughs> which is optimized and optimized and optimized, and in the last 60 years and. Uh, you cannot get a lot out of those here. You cannot get a lot more. I mean, you need your wetted area, you have your wingspan, you can change the engines, get better and better, but uh, the configuration itself, um, as it is, won't change or will not get a lot more efficient. So that's the status. And now let's just look at flying wings here, because that was our thesis from the beginning. And, um, well, yeah, let's just look at the first flying wing there was. Um, this is the uh, Quetzal Coetlus. Um, lived many, many millions of years ago, probably, and um, is indeed a, a bird with only one lifting surface in the direction of flight. So, it does fly. There are still people uh, around who claim that such aircraft or such birds, or well, air, they claim aircraft couldn't fly that way, but um, <coughs> they can, at least birds can, so um, and we've done that with aircraft as well. So that flies very well. And we don't look, have to look so um, far uh, back today. Uh, um, eagles soar the skies, and uh, they have also only one lifting surface in the direction of flight. You see a slight tail here. But um, this is more for, um, uh, well, this is also used in certain flight conditions. Uh, it can spread. But generally, for efficient flight, we find that nature only has one wing. For efficient uh, glider flight, we only have one wing in the direction of flight. So um, <coughs> that seems to be quite a good approach. Um, Nature also came up with something like this. This is a seed of a plant. It flies very well. And you see that also it only has one wing or one lifting surface in the direction of flight. So there are, um, there are, yeah, there are examples from nature which prove that this is possible. And um, that this is possible can also, um, I can also show here very, very briefly, or I can at least give you some um, background here on the, on the stable flight in the longitudinal direction, what they say. So you have an aircraft, when an aircraft flies, um, but requirement at the moment for passenger aircraft is that, is that they fly stable in that direction. So that when there's a disturbance, maybe a gust from here, which changes the angle, angle of attack. Or maybe if the aircraft itself, maybe due to some disturbance, gets this angle of attack here, that by itself it returns to its state of flight. And this is achieved uh, when two points are positioned well. So when we have a wing here, then um, you need to know where one certain point of the wing is. And this is the neutral point. The neutral point is the point when the aircraft flies like this, just like this, and you have somehow a disturbance, an angle of attack change, where then we will have additional lift. So the aircraft flies trimmed very well, everything all right, gravitational force in the center of gravity, lift above 
So it's also in the center of gravity, no moments, just very perfect, stable flight. But when we have disturbance, then it is just in the, in the physics of, list, of lifting surface, of any lifting surface, that we have an additional force which will act in a point, and this point only depends on the platform of the aircraft. So, so the neutral point is that point where you have that additional force for the player. And this is nothing, you know, this is, uh, I mean, you can improve that with uh, normal mechanics. Um, you, you can just accept it, you can go in the wind tunnel and test it. Because it's just something which is, you know, which you need to know when you design it. So you, you, you have that neutral point, and the question is where is it? So just as a very general rule, uh, it's maybe not a good rule, but it's, uh, it gives you a really, yeah, just gives you very quickly just uh, a good imagination where that point is. Um, just draw the, the 25% uh, line of the, of the wing, and then um, just um, look where in that direction um, would be the line to support that wing, so uh, the aerial center of gravity in that direction here. So just maybe roughly, I don't know, maybe here. So just right there. So here, roughly, is the neutral point. And now, that is just something uh, which comes from, from experience, physics, whatever. So now, if our aircraft flies, and we have that gust coming, and we have our additional force in the neutral point, what happens then? Um, we have more lift. So more lift will cause, of course, the aircraft to, to go up even further. But uh, what do we want? We want that additional force to act behind the center of gravity so that our aircraft goes down again. So then we have a stable system. Of course, there's, there are other um, influences, and this, the system is also damped. Um, if it's, yeah, so, but this, this is just the very general rule. Our neutral point needs to be behind the center of gravity. So the center <coughs> of gravity of the aircraft needs to be right here. So there's, um, there's, of course, some experience with aircraft building where that exactly needs to be. And it roughly needs to be, um, yeah, just like I, just like I drew it. And um, now, with that in mind, though, here's something interesting. If you build a flying wing, I mean, with all that stability I just said, you can just uh, keep that in mind. Of course, that needs to be fulfilled. But of course, your aircraft also needs to be trimmed. You know, it also needs to fly, I mean, without, in, in cruise flight, all those forces, so from on the, on the, on the wing, acting upwards here, uh, need, to, uh, need to be in equilibrium around that line here. So you need to generate lift here and lift right here, and it has to be equal, right? So you have to have the same amount of lift on that side and on that side. So that the aircraft can fly, that, that your moments are, um, that the sum of all moments is uh, zero. So now that, that, that's kind of a dilemma, right? Because you have not very much space here and you have a lot of space right there. So, so that's a problem. So how do you do that? Well, um, profiles generate a lot of lift over here. Um, at the front, not very much lift here. There are certain kinds of profiles which generate a lot of lift here, and not very much here. Um, they're just different kinds of airfoils around. So, also, you may realize that when you um, change the sweep of this wing, that you generate, um, that, that these points will move, of course. And you, you see when you move that a little bit, when you, when you change it, that you can actually find 
that you can actually really find a sweet angle where you can generate lift here and lift here, and you have it roughly in equilibrium. So, th so this is uh, you can change those parameters of the wing, and you can change them so that actually you are uh, fine. So, um, and you can of course change profiles and so on. Of course, you know what normal aircraft do? They just make it real simple. They just add a horizontal cap uh, surface here, and then um, of course you can maybe create some downforce here. That's what that was what the early pioneers did. They just uh, they they had that problem, so they just added some um, tail surface, which generated downforce, so that everything was trimmed. So, but we don't want to do that because we want to stay as simple as possible here with the aircraft uh, and only have one wing. Um, all right. So, but you see, it seems possible. Because um, that plant uh, can fly. And um, the interesting thing is now that, um, that there, there's another thing. That's the interesting thing. The interesting thing is that there's another thing. Um, and the, this other thing is that, um, that we can't just do what we want here in spin wise direction. I mean, you could say, all right, if I now look at this whole picture from right here, I look at the wing from right here, and I draw the lift distribution over the span of the aircraft. So I have lift here, lots and lots of lift, no, and no lift here anymore. Okay? So that's the span of the aircraft, and I draw maybe, I don't know, for this to be stable, Lots and lots of lift here, not a lot of lift on the outside. So, well, a very popular German, uh, uh, yeah, mathematician, uh, uh, he he found that this is uh, that this here <coughs> is not efficient at all. He found that to minimize this induced drag, this needs to be elliptical for a given spec. So this is another thing which influences our plan form of the aircraft. So we want this here to be elliptical. And now, now imagine all those things. Right? You, you, you want to, the aircraft to be stable. You want this to be elliptical. And um, you want it to be trimmed. All these three things, and if you just if you just um, get them all right together in your platform design of the aircraft. So the platform is always when I look at the aircraft from here. This is what they call the platform, and uh, then you can get a stable aircraft. Then you can get an aircraft which um, is trimmed, and then you can get an aircraft with an elliptical lift distribution so that um, that this induced drag is as low as possible. Of course, spend needs to be high, okay, but this is just a preliminary um, assumption or, or just requirement, but then also we want to have um, elliptical lift distribution. So elliptical lift distribution would mean something like this. That would be great. That minimizes the induced drag. So now, um, there's just one more thing, and then no more, no more physics. Okay. All right. Just, just, just one more important thing, um, which is this. Um, Brandon found out, or one, one of his assistants found out, actually, that um, when you have this elliptical lift distribution over a wing. So I look at the wing from the top. So this is our wing. He found out that when you have the wing, maybe just like this here, so you sweep it back, but everything stays parallel. So this has the same area like this. Then he found out 
that if the lift distribution over this wing is elliptical, then and the lift distribution over the other wing is elliptical, that then you have the same induced drag. Okay, so that the induced drag does not, in other words, depend on the position of the lifting elements in the um, direction of flight. So, so that is a, a really important thing here um, for that, that, that is something which uh, is uh, yeah extremely important for, for, for the aircraft which is designed here. That no matter where my lift is produced, if the lift distribution is known, this sets the induced drag. Okay? Alright. So now um, people have built flying wings. Um, this was done at the uh, somewhere sometime around 1910. John Donner built the D5, uh, which is a biplane, of course. Um, so two lifting surfaces, but on top of each other, not behind <coughs> each other. So it can be considered as a flying wing. You see the swept back design. So I, I, I said to, to to get that right here. It's probably good to to sweep back a little bit more. And um, it flew quite well. And then, of course, you have another thing here. You have Hugo Junkers, who was, many say he got a patent for the flying wing, which is not quite true. He got a patent for his idea to try to put people inside a wing. So that was his proposal, to store all major parts inside a wing. Uh, of course, he, he also thought of the flying wing itself, but he wanted to put all major parts inside the wing. So, um, and this is the same thing, which, um, which I, um, yeah, which which I, basically, I, I took that and tried to make it more efficient with the design I'll present now. All right. So here is just another picture to show you that um, they were aircraft which flew without a horizontal tailplane. And lots of them flew actually. Um, this is the Messerschmitt ME-163, which has no horizontal tailplane and flies very well. Uh, more than 350 aircraft of that sort were built. And there's just no problem. You just need to position a uh, center of gravity and neutral point right. Then it's all fine. Okay. Um, so now, well, from that, I can draw many conclusions. So, what do I want? I want a pressurized cargo section available. I want, of course, le a good level of comfort. I want to trim my aircraft. I want to evacuate all those passengers. I want to take off and land at existing airports. I want to be the aircraft compatible with the ground infrastructure. So the goal is, in short, to find a flying wing commercial passenger aircraft not violating those constraints here with a mass as low as possible and a lift to drag ratio as high as possible. So I would spend well, I cannot be higher as the gate limits, but as high as possible and wet the area as low as possible. So that is basically our um, goal here. And from that goal, I can derive certain design features. For instance, when I say low mass, well, what does that mean? That, that, that's, pro, that's, that's a wish list here. All right? So, so, so that, I, I have looked at all those physics things now. I have looked at history now. I've looked at disadvantages and advantages. And now I, I'm, I'm making a list. What would I like to have? Almost circular cross section. Um, I would like to have a nice elliptical mass distribution. Because I want to have an elliptical lift distribution. I don't want to have any bending moment. So elliptical mass and elliptical lift. That would be wonderful. Um, I want to put my engines close to the center axis. Because then, when one fails, I don't get very many moments. Or, or not very high moments. Um, I want low transonic drag. OK, if the aircraft flies very, very fast, the profile sections shouldn't be too um, too thick. So that's what they call the compressible drag. It shouldn't be very high. 
I want, um, <coughs> that my cabin um, is, yeah, well, I want the cabin to be not very long in flight direction so that when people move or when uh, the aircraft is loaded, um, not very, um, <coughs> not the way I want it to load. So if maybe there's, uh, the aircraft doesn't fly at full, so if the people, uh, if there's only people sitting at the front, only people sitting at the back, I want a low cabin length so that the center of gravity of the aircraft does not move. Okay, so if people only sit up here, center of gravity will move here. If, the, if people only sit up there, center of gravity will move over there. So very long aircraft have that problem. So I want to make the aircraft quite short. Um, that, that's also one of my wishes. And I want to have enough wing area to not need high lift devices. I don't want to modify the shape of the wing <laughs> at takeoff and landing. I just want to get it all done with one aircraft, with one wing, without moving parts. Without any moving parts. I want to have the aircraft wheel um, real simple and only one wing with yeah, with just the wing area. Enough to not need high lift devices. I want to shield my engines from the ground and again simple and straight lines. So um, yeah. Now the train of thought. How um, do we get there? Um, we take away the horizontal stabilizer. When we take that away, we have low wet area. So that's good. Um, but then, of course, um, we need to modify our wing. We need to make our wing bigger. Because um, we cannot use high lift devices anymore. Because we cannot, cannot trim the aircraft very, very well. So then we find we create a lot of, we have just very much space for the wing and the cabin use. So, so when we have any airport vehicles, so loading, unloading the aircraft, it's all in the way. The wing is in the way here. And uh, it's also not very good to, um, to actually save wet area. So there's another, yeah, we just might need some other, some other, thought here. So now, the thought was, if you have one fuselage here, and you want to not have a very long fuselage, if you take that fuselage and shift it just like this, it gets shorter. It gets shorter, of course, in flight direction. So just leave it like this. Then we want to have a simple aircraft. So we take two fuselages. So we make a V. Then, with just with that measure, we have a lot of the flaws of my wish list we can, we can check. Because what, what has happened? We have now a mass distribution which goes over the span. So we have a V, so our mass is distributed more over the span. So that, that's the V shape. Then, also, we have that, those two fuselages connected very well in the middle. So, and it, very high. They, they are, they are, it's a very high connection. So let's say we have six abreast aircraft, so almost four meter connection in the middle. So if we have some bending, <coughs> it's not so significant. So just have the V here. And then the most interesting part of having a fuselage which is not in the direction of flight is that when we cut through that fuselage in the flight direction, we have an ellipse. Whereas when we cut um, in a 90 degree angle to the fuselage, we have just, yeah, we, we, we only have just a circle. So when you look at conventional airfoils nowadays, they kind of look like, like this. That's, that's the transonic wing section. Now just imagine, if I wanted to pe put people in here, like like Hugo Junkers proposed, I would just put them, like, I, I would like to use uh, that, that space here. But I would also like to have a cabin just like this. So if I did that, that would not be very good. So what I would like to do is just 
just that here, to have an ellipse. And I do have an ellipse when I just put my fuselage at an angle to the flight direction. And the wonderful thing is that this gives us a very nice configuration also. So, so, so that's just use of space in the airport. But if we look how our plan form actually looks then, so, so that's just the first thought, because then the plan form, how it looks, we have a wonderful swept back design, and we find that our center of gravity is actual, actually easy to place in front of the neutral point. You can see my first uh, assumption here, the neutral point is the white one, whereas the center of gravity is the black one. Um, you can place them very nicely um, in, in a way that the aircraft is actually stable. So, um, of course, engines, um, uh, yeah, that you can see that first drawing where they were placed very um, close together so that their movements aren't very high. So this is, uh, these are the first drawings. Of course, that, uh, we, I, I, I couldn't keep it that way. Um, that's, the, that's the configuration as it is. So, as I found it uh, after some iteration loops. And you can see here, you have um, those swept back fuselages. You have a middle wing section, which follows the sweep. You have a transition wing and an outer wing. And all those wings together create a plan form, which is really quite interesting, because it is very easy with that plan form to maintain natural stability. It is very easy to trim that plan form, and it has certain features, such as that um, maybe, um, maybe right here. So if I have this plan form, just, just like that, and I leave away that part right here, you can probably imagine, remember how I told you how the neutral point is right at that 25% line, right here. If I would, if I would fill, if I would fill that last triangle here, so then have a conventional blended wing body, that whole neutral point would go further to the back, which means that also the center of gravity as this pair of points also needs to be close together, would also go to the back. Then, if I had some control surfaces right here, the lever arm of those control surfaces to the center of gravity would be lower, which means when I make a maneuver or when I need to trim the aircraft, I need to just I, I destroy my elliptical lift distribution and I destroy it more when that set of points is further to the back than when it is right here. So this is, um, th th there are just many features of that um, plan form which is, which, yeah, it just fits quite nicely. Um, all right, so um, here are some different views and um, the profiles I came up with. So you see the very thin profile in the streamwise direction and 90 degree cut to the leading edge, very, um, yeah, just, the, the, the circular cabin fits in quite nicely. Um, maybe interesting, a lot of people address the issue of the seats, which aren't in flight direction. This is certified. There are business class cabins around, so the comfortable cabins, which have seats which are turned, actually 45 degrees. And if you imagine you turn on your seat just a little bit, uh, it's not that much. So um, it could actually add to more comfort but of course, it's an issue. It is an issue which has to be uh, looked at. There are other options possible. So I want to tell you that this is not the last. Uh, this is not the end of the story. There are um, other options possible. the The idea is to have that oblique fuselage, and around that, your um, your wing which creates a very nice uh, cabin area to wet area ratio. And around that, you can build your aircraft. 
So here, with the aircraft I looked at now, you have roughly 350 or 15 <coughs> people in a double class layout, which is roughly a 350 size. So I set the wingspan at 65 meters. Um, you can, uh, you could probably, though, um, put cargo more to the outside um, and not in a, in a second um, tube behind all uh, the passengers. And if you did that, maybe you would have some other, um, yeah, some, some other advantages. So it's, it's not fixed, the configuration yet. There are many, many studies which still have to be done. So here, now, um, a lot of people thought that this could fly at all. I mean, we, we've discussed that now. You, you should now know that this can fly very well, but many people thought it couldn't. So we, um, um, yeah, I just uh, built a model to, to, to say or to, to prove that it works. Here you can see the aircraft. Here you can see the elliptical use, the lift distribution. You can see um, that this is achieved with some wing twist, and uh, you can see the the local values of the of the lift. <coughs> and now I want to uh, show to you that it actually, um, yeah, that it actually flies.
And again, that could turn into 40 or that could turn into negative 20. So it's, uh, it's, you never know. But it is just roughly, it is a competitor. Let's just say that. All right, so then it was important to just estimate the mass of the aircraft, right? So we have, as, uh, or I've looked at aerodynamics with the lattice vortex method, which was shown before, and now I look at the mass of the aircraft. So how do you estimate the mass of such an aircraft? Well, what you do is you take existing aircraft part and try to put them all together to, um, to, to yeah, and try to, to, to make the first good guess. So I took A320 fuselage sections and put them together, engines um, A350, gear A350, then you can, I took some A320 wings because the wing area is just the same, and then um, with that you can uh, get a first rough estimation of the mass. You make uh, a table, and you only, I, I only looked at the structure. So power units, so engines and other things, systems, furnishings, operating items, all the same, because we have the same amount of passengers, same, so really all the same, and only the structure. So for the structure, I made an estimate, and then, um, <coughs> I mean, I could, as you see here, I could make the estimate for fuselage, for, for, um, for, yeah, for, for the cargo section, so that was easy. The only thing for which I could make the estimate for was for the interior structure. So for that, really, I had just to take a number, and then I had to verify this number. Um, here, when you um, take all that, um, all these mass components now, and draw them over the span of the aircraft, you can see uh, black is our um, operation weight empty, then we get our payload on top of that, our fuel on top of that, that sets us a line loading. So, so we look at the aircraft from the front, and we have the loading of the aircraft. Then we have the lift. You know, that's our nice red elliptical lift distribution. And that will then result in some bending moments. Here on the lower diagram, you can see those bending moments at a 2.5 G maneuver, when the aircraft just goes through just a very um, great turn. And uh, yeah, then it, it looks like this. And what you can see here, then you can estimate the bending moments. And from those bending moments, I could then actually, uh, so then I look also at torsion of the aircraft. And from all that, um, from all that data you get then, you can go back um, and resize the structure of the aircraft, knowing the structure of the reference aircraft, and then, um, revise and um, that was then very conservatively so to be absolutely sure here uh, we uh, well that benefit of two percent it, it <coughs> roughly comes out at the same mass so we have a very um, serious aerodynamic benefit here and roughly the same mass of the aircraft so um, now also you, you need to now you have the aircraft now it's set, and now you need to compare it with everything. Aerodynamic performance, mass. Now we need to look at um, takeoff and landing. Can the aircraft take off and land at the existing airport? You have a rough uh, takeoff velocity of 150 knots, and you look, uh, what are your flat deflections for that? What is if your center of gravity is moved to the front a little bit because of other loading, then you will need more uh, flat deflections here. How high are they? Uh, you can see um, here for their 1.7, 6.2, 10 degrees, this is all fine. And um, yeah, we can actually take off the land at existing airports here, as it was found out here. Uh, the, the angle, it takes off at 12 degrees, so that is all fine as well. Um, then what you look at also is um, the loading of the aircraft. As I said before, here, you have the center of gravity. So just imagine now, uh, you have your aircraft right here. The aircraft has a center of gravity when it is empty, and then people board the aircraft. Then the center of gravity shifts, first to the front, then to the back, depending on if they just enter here or here. 
and then the cargo is moved inside the aircraft, and then a fuel is put inside the aircraft. So then our center of gravity moves, which gives us a center of gravity range. And um, this was determined as well. And then for that, you can determine the lift to drag ratio, how it drops for those center of gravity positions. Because when center of gravity moves, you need to extend your flaps at the, or yeah, just flap is just, you know, uh, just a word for any kind of not just the flaps we take from the landing, which we don't have here, but just the control surfaces in the back. So we can just extend, we have to extend our flaps, which destroys our good lift distribution. So um, you can see how the, the lift to drag ratio drops, but it didn't, I, again, I erased the numbers here, but it did not drop underneath the highest number, the cruise flight number of the A350. So even for other positions, it did not drop underneath that belt. All right. So then, of course, that was so that those were uh, those had the qualities. So in that that direction. Now the question is um, lateral handling qualities. So what what about this stability? And a simulation was done for that. Um, I looked at when you look at the aircraft just like this you can see that the wings at the outside go up a little bit. You have a, kind of a little V-shape right here, uh, dihedral, they call that. So you have a slight dihedral here. If we don't, if you don't have that, if you don't have any winglets, you can see that first diagram there. Uh, if you have a slight disturbance here, so a slight angle like this, the aircraft will, will break out. Whereas when you have a slight dihedral and some winglets here, you are quite stable. Of course, they have to be a lot more, a um, lot more studies done here. And um, what is, I mean, but but it's just, it's all very preliminary. It's just uh, looking at all aspects and taking the right amount of time looking at those aspects, getting just the right information to then, uh, then continue with other, um, then have, having other people continue at those points. So. Another interesting thing is we have 2.8 meters here when we look at the aircraft from the front. So that gives us enough space to load cargo inside the aircraft from the back here. So also maybe, um, yeah, also point which is interesting. All right. So now let me come to, let me come to the conclusion here. Um, that is the aircraft as it is as it is in my design freeze. Um, how, how I um, think it's the best. Uh, it can be, <coughs> but uh, I think this is not the the last um, last picture. We'll see if that kind of aircraft. Um, a lot of things can still be changed. Um, here's another picture which you saw on the um, on the flyer. Um, it is an aircraft with the same span as the A350. It fits the same gate. It has lower weighted area. It has um, lower induced drag. Uh, same amount of passengers, same amount of cargo. Um, of course, there will have to be addressed a lot of issues still. So I, I have a list here another wish list here, uh, which I would like to be um, looked at by other people. You know, this project is at a point where it cannot be done by a single person or by ten people. It needs a lot of people and it needs a lot of time. I cannot do anything about this anymore. So that, that's, I, I proposed that and now it needs very many people to, to look at that. Um, first of all, we need a whole design of a structure for that. For the airplane, we need just a just just a structure so we can um, actually look at uh, uh, look at the weight of the aircraft. Uh, we need more detailed aerodynamic calculations. So um, the wave drag or the compressible drag is the aircraft uh, is the drag of the aircraft uh, because of um, the, the thickness of the sections. 
you saw that the sections, that the profile sections here in the middle are pretty thick, whereas here they are pretty, um, pretty thin. This is fine because this wing here is not loaded very much, whereas those are. So it is, it is all right. We don't expect any shocks on that wing, but um, it, it has to be looked at. 3D effects. Now, that was the lattice vortex method. There might be some, um, well, I don't know, there might be. So there might be many things which could um, be uh, what they say a showstopper. So um, we have to need to look at that. Then the CL max of the aircraft. So, so how high is the angle of attack actually? Uh, how high can it be? Um, Takeoff and landing calculation. Uh, we need that. Um, Takeoff rotation. So the engines are on top of the aircraft. If that, uh, if that aircraft uh, gives full thrust, we fly or we want to rotate. These engines create a nose down pitching moment. We have a good thing here is that with blended wing bodies, where this part here is filled, you have, as I said before, the neutral point is further to the back. Also, the center of gravity is further to the back. Also, the landing gear is further to the back. So, the lever arm of control surfaces to the center of gravity is very, very low. Whereas on this design, with this uh, space left open, these points are further to the front. So you actually have a higher lever arm, which is very beneficial, but still has to be looked at um, and needs to be calculated. Now, engine failure. If one fails, are these, uh, do these suffice? Um, then um, crosswind landing. What happens when you have, well, yeah, as the word said, crosswind, you want to land. Um, then, of course, emergency evacuation. Um, that is, that is a, a hot topic here uh, with any uh, flying wing. So with the blended wing design, uh, it wasn't, it could, there were ways to do it, but the actual benefits of the blended wing weren't high enough to put all the work or to actually design all those features needed for the evacuation. It can be done with the blended wing. There's no problem whatsoever. It's just that the benefit of the aircraft is not so high that you want to, to do it. So here, you have a way higher benefit just by first principle estimations than, than the blended wing. So, so, so many, many years, 10, 20 years now, people have studied the blended wing. Millions of, uh, of uh, money were invested. And uh, now here's uh, just by first principle, many of those um, things look better. So uh, in short, uh, you should uh, investigate that uh, if you are interested. And uh, then, um, of course, uh, yeah, the configuration is not fixed. Cargo compartments, fuel tanks, uh, they can change, of course. Uh, then, the general size and capacity um, will also be interesting, right? So, an aircraft is only built if it's good for the market, and if uh, the market uh, situation is so that you need an aircraft in a two-class layout with 350 passengers. Will we need an aircraft of that size in 20, 30 years? I don't know. So um, can, it be, can it be larger? Well, um, a boundary condition for that aircraft here is the distance passengers have to the center axis. Because if that aircraft rolls, people sit further away from the center axis. Here, it's 13 meters. 13 meters was determined by several studies that people don't notice. So there were simulations done, people were set into simulators, and people did not notice the difference at all. So, so that's, that's a boundary here. So if we wanted to increase that size of the aircraft further, we would have to go into maybe two tubes, larger tubes, double bubble, I don't know. So there, there are different ways um, which, uh, which could do that, how this could be done. That a family concept, could we maybe cut out here and just move it there, like, like this. So create a small aircraft, a bigger aircraft, with just changing that aircraft very, um, very easily. It seems to be more <coughs> conventional than the blended wing. So that tube um, building scenario is more, seems more conventional. All right.
Um, yeah, so I, I have a last um, video here, which I want to show you. Um, and then this presentation is over, and then you can ask questions. Um, I would, um, yeah, I would like to uh, say thank you for all those people who have who've helped me with that. So there's, uh, I, I won't, I won't uh, mention any names because then I'll forget somebody and then um, it's not going to be very good. But, but I have had a lot, lot of help uh, with that project from, from friends, family, um, people at the university. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. And this way, this could be achieved. And um, at the moment, the status of the project is that um, the major uh, aircraft manufacturer looks further into some um, details here. And um, also the DLR has expressed lots of interest. And uh, we just need, at the moment, very many people looking at that. And uh, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of money needs, put, needs to be put into that. And uh, I think it could be, maybe, because it is easy, just by first glance, to see the advantages here. All right, uh, so let's look at the last video. <coughs>